and welcome to another edition of the TFB Spotlight interview. And I'm really, really excited this time because I'm going to be interviewing Cindy Thomason of Bookskeep. And Cindy is a virtual bookkeeper. She's been in business for quite a few years. We'll, we'll dig in and get her details. But she specializes in e-commerce businesses. So she is already a specializing bookkeeper or a niched bookkeeper. And I know a little bit about how that happened, but I know that it made a huge difference in her business once she turned to specialization. And she also, you may recall that I did an interview with Mike Michalowicz when the book Clockwork was released a few weeks ago. And Cindy is someone who has clockworked her business. So I'm really excited because I want to hear this whole story uh, to find out the progression of how Cindy started, first of all, and then where she is today. And I think you're going to find her story very, very inspirational. So Cindy, thank you so much for agreeing to do this. Oh, happy to, Gabrielle. Always fun to talk with you. <laughs> yes. Yeah, Cindy and I have known each other for a little while because of Mike and Profit First. So that's really how we met each other. But why don't you tell us a little bit, how is it that you got your bookkeeping business started and how long ago was that? I started as a just a virtual assistance business. Mm -hmm. um, actually not so virtual uh, basically I had a girlfriend needed help <laughs> and um, she got a government contract and my corporate experience um, years ago was in um, in a small engineering firm where we did a lot of government contract work and so I knew the accounting side of that business the contract mm -hmm. side of the business age I, I served a, several different roles so I went in and helped her get her her um, systems in place for this government contract and uh, after we got finished she's like can you just stay and help me so mm. I did and it worked out well I was a stay-at-home mom at this point my daughter was really young and uh, we had decided to homeschool her and but she was she was going to some tutors for different things and it was um, I, I had some time and she had her horse and you know it was just a, it was time for me to just kind of get back in the workforce a little bit and so I helped my my friend and as um, as I was doing that I started doing her books I started doing books for the um, agency that uh, she was managing um, and I got introduced to QuickBooks Online I had put in place three different accounting systems in my corporate world and so I, I knew how it worked and how it was how it how accounting systems work. I knew accounting. Um, but it was really interesting to me to see this idea of uh, how you could, how QuickBooks Online, I, I didn't have to go into her office. I could work from home. Mm -hmm. And a friend of mine lost her job at a corporate job around the same time, and she started a virtual assistance business. She was getting people wanting help with QuickBooks, and so she knew I could help with that. So that's how I built my my first client base was helping a friend, helping another friend in, um, through her referrals, and um, at I think at the t point I had ten or eleven clients, I decided I really wanted to focus on um, on the virtual bookkeeping side and not everything else. A question though regarding because you so you started with QuickBooks Online, is that right? I did. Mm -hmm. How long ago was that? Because a long time ago, QuickBooks Online was a terrible product. <laughs> it wasn't really great at that time. Um, about what, yeah, about, do you know about what year was it? 2012, 2013, something like that. Okay, okay. So yeah, yeah. it was still not a, it was not a great product at that point, no. but it was, no, it was functional. Yeah, it, it worked for what we needed. And I really wanted, I, I needed, um, to be able to work from home because mm -hmm. of my daughter. And so, um, I, you know, it, I, I never wanted, I was never interested in learning desktop because I, I didn't want to have to go into the office. That was a barrier to serving my first client was I have to go in there, you yeah. know? And, yeah. uh, so it just was, uh, and, and she was a home-based business. So, you know, she had her life going on and it took a lot of coordination 
Oh my gosh, I'm sorry to hear that. We're having a thunderstorm. Yeah, well, right, very close by. It's kind of unnerving. Wow. I'm not normally scared of storms, but that was close. <laughs> um, so, yeah, it, it wasn't a great product then, but man, it's come a long way since then. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, because I exclusively use QuickBooks Online. But what we can draw from that is that you really had a great start to your virtual bookkeeping business in that you never did the local going out to the client working with the desktop software or even using the remote connections you started using quickbooks online which was the cloud-based software right so that's great I had, yeah i had one client um as i was first starting out that wanted me to use the desktop version and was convinced that we had to. And so uh, um, I had a, a part-time employee that ha was familiar with it, and we put it in place. I just pulled my hair out. I just said, this is not worth it. you know. And I told him, I said, either I'll convert you or, or you need to find somebody else. And we converted him, and it worked fine. So mm -hmm. there was really no reason at that point not to, to use QuickBooks Online. Yeah, that, that's good. Now, now let's go back to the beginning because at that point you mentioned you had an employee already. But when you first decided that you were you were working as a virtual assistant, helping your friend, then you really decided you liked the bookkeeping and you had discovered already QuickBooks Online. You were getting more of the bookkeeping. So at what point did you say, OK, I'm going to start my own business? Was it um, did it peter out with your friend, or did you literally have to break off, or how did that? I had to break off. Um, I, I read the E-Myth, um, uh -huh. re revisited, or so I'm not sure which one, but I, yeah. the, the, the one that was popular at the time, and I saw myself as Sally the pie maker person, and I'm like, I'm hating this person that was a friend because of the work relationship, and I'm right. just like, you know, I don't want to hate her. Uh, it's it is a function of the system that we're in. Her being the entrepreneur, me really enjoying and feeling like I had a lot to give and taking on more and more, and it just became a conflict. And so I I I made the decision at that point. I love the bookkeeping. I love the fact that I didn't have to go into an office. I I had enough clients that I you know. For me, it was just a supplemental uh, part of our family income. Um, my daughter has severe dyslexia, and so mm. at that point, we were paying um, over $1,000 a month in her extra tutoring for her uh, dyslexia. So I wanted to be able to pay for that. We had to travel two hours to get to the tutor one oh, wow. way, you wow. know, three, three times a week. So, mm. I mean, it was a big uh, it was a big part of our lifestyle was being able to get her what she needed and me being flexible so um, so I made the decision yeah I it was time for me to do my own thing I, I was itching to do it you know and uh, so that was in 20 early 2014 I made the decision to, to rebrand as a bookkeeper and um, I started the business books keep at that point mm -hmm. and Decided when I saw the first QuickBooks Connect um, uh, conference that they were having uh -huh. that I wanted to go to that that it felt like okay that's my people that's, mm -hmm. that's what I'm really um, gravitating towards and so I told my um, web designer I said I want it all done before I go onto this conference because I don't know what it's going to be but I want to I want to have my branding done so. That's really what I kind of consider when I launched the bookkeeping side was uh, around uh, the October 2014 time frame. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very good. Yes, I remember the first QuickBooks Connect. Yes, very good. But how did you, so you started this business and you already had some clients because you developed them from when you were working with uh, your friend. But how did you now grow the business? How did you market or how did you get more clients? You had a website, we know. <laughs> <laughs> right. I um, had my website. That, that was it. It was all word of mouth. Every client, mm -hmm. and I still have the bulk of them, um, they came to me through friends of, of my existing clients. Mm -hmm. And uh, they are in a variety of different industries in a location that's about an hour and a half away from me. So they're not, like, super close. Um, in fact, my web designer told me, he said, 
you know, one of the best decisions he ever made was not to do web design work for people in his building because they just kept popping in and taking yeah. up his time. He said, don't do business with anybody local. <laughs> and, you know, he's kind of right. Uh, and, and that kind of set my mindset up to, okay, I don't want anybody that I'm going to run into the grocery store who's going to just drop in and try to bring me stuff, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, um, so it was all referral um, up until, and, and that QuickBooks Connect was was major for me because that is when I met Mike. I heard him speak, yeah. and he uh, presenting Profit First, the very the first version in 2014. Mm -hmm. And uh, I took the book um, that he was giving out that and read it on the plane ride home. Mm. And uh, I just knew this is what my clients needed. They were really struggling with profitability and cash flow, and mm -hmm. so um, I I. Immediately, I, I, in November, I joined the Profit First Professionals group, mm -hmm. and that totally changed everything in terms of I start. I had a, a referral source, source then. You know, they were sending me leads mm -hmm. um, through Profit First. Yeah, that's fantastic. Now, at that point, your client base, they were all different kinds of businesses? Yeah, so yeah, it was generalized. Everything. So tell us the yeah. story about how you decided to then start to specialize. How did you come into deciding to work with e-commerce businesses? Well, one of the very first referrals that I got from Profit First was a woman in, um, I'm based in Northwest Arkansas, and she was in Southwest Arkansas. Mm. But I, I received that referral from Profit First because we were both in the same state. Um, she was an e-commerce um, seller, and we figured out how to make e-commerce work with Profit First um, uh -huh. in her business. And she, oh my gosh, she, she was so connected through Facebook that she just sent me so many people. And so I, I you know, within a matter of a, a couple of months, just had a, a, a half dozen to, a, you know, a dozen maybe of e-commerce businesses that I was working with. And, uh -huh. and Honestly, it was a tough decision, though. I really struggled with if I wanted to work in that niche. Mm -hmm. There was a lot that I connected with. A lot of them were like me, kind of looking at a second career. E-commerce can be done from anywhere. I, I like that part of my business. Uh, they're pretty tech savvy because mm -hmm. everything they do is on a computer platform. And right. So there was a lot I connected with, but the um, with the exception of the first one that came to me, a lot of them weren't making any money, uh -huh. and I was like, uh, can they really afford to my services? Uh, most of them didn't have good books, and I got them mm. all put together for them. And then I had to tell them, "This is not look good, you know. <laughs> <Right>. I, <laughs> I don't know. You're you don't have gross margin here uh, to even work towards how to have profit. You know, I mean, it was, it was fundamental problems, and mm -hmm. so I was really struggling with whether or not that was what I wanted to do. I was working with Mike at. Mm -hmm. um, how it's um, and going through the surge process with him then and we we really debate debated two or three avenues but mm -hmm. I I came I, I one of the referrals that came to me was somebody who um, I just connected with mm -hmm. that and his business was doing really well mm. and I, it made me realize that there were there are different types of Amazon sellers, you yes. know, and um, they they have uh, some of them specialize in retail arbitrage. Some of them uh, are wholesale; they they present wholesale products. Mm -hmm. uh, some of them go out and, and develop private labels uh, products themselves. Right. This guy was a private label product um, seller, and. I I still that's where I gravitate to because the the way they think about their business really fits with the way I think about business. So he, he's an ideal client and has been a great client for well since late 2015. Mm, very good. So through that process of first you were going through the specialization process, which is Mike's surge process from his right. book Surge. Um, by going through that, you were able to more clearly define, even within this niche of e-commerce, what does an ideal e-commerce client look like, right? 
for me, yes. Yeah. And, and we know when we get one of those, we really go after them. Mm -hmm. um, because those are the ones that we feel like we can help the most. I, I do have other clients, and I'm approached by clients that are retail arbitrage or wholesale, and um, we know their business and can work with them as, as also, but I, I just tend to gravitate toward those people that are designing and making their product. I just, I don't know, that just, uh, my husband has always worked in manufacturing, and so mm. that people that are making things just kind of connects with us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's great. Now, what about other businesses, either your existing clients that are in totally different fields or any other referrals that come in to you from, say, a hair salon or any other type of business that has nothing to do with e-commerce? I mean, do you turn those clients away? Yeah. Hmm. Was that hard to do in the beginning? Yes, until I took myself out of the sales process, uh -huh. <laughs> and the um, my team member Bree is just like, we don't want those people. I'm like, okay, <laughs> um, you know, she's 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 great at it. She just likes, you know, that's not where we're headed, and she's right. It's very hard for me to talk to people and then not want to help them, and so the key mm. was. I don't talk to them anymore. <laughs> you know, so you have job. one of your employees who handles the at least the beginning of the sale sales process. She handles it all now. Wow, that's fantastic. Yeah, it is. Excellent. It's wonderful. Yeah. Excellent. Now here's a question because we're not we're kind of I'm guiding it, but we're kind of there's a lot that has happened to you in a relatively short period of time. At what point did you go from working by yourself? to hiring help? Uh, pretty early. Mm -hmm. I I know I am not the best detail person. Mm -hmm. I can do bookkeeping and I know how to do it. Um, it takes it takes a certain um, amount of my energy and brain power where I can't be distracted with other things. Mm -hmm. um, and as I was growing the business, the, the moving back and forth between trying to do client work and trying to grow the business, it just, I'm not good at flipping between those things. Mm -hmm. And I, I really like the, the strategic side of things more. And so I, I very on, early on figured out I wanted somebody else who was good with the details doing that because I knew the product would be better than if I did it. So when you hired, you first hired for what administration and bookkeepers? Just bookkeepers. I did all the admin. Ah, mm -hmm. I see. Very good. Excellent. Yeah. Excellent. So then you, you when working with Mike and uh, Profit First Professionals through the surge process in order to specialize, how did that affect your business? I mean, was it a slow growth? Was it something that happened quickly? How did it how did the making the leap to specialization, which is something most of us are afraid of, once you made that leap, what effect did it have on your practice? It was, um, it grew quicker than I could keep up. Mm. It grew so fast because... Um, and this was really all, without a lot of advertising because most of your business I, is coming I, from... I other than, you know, um, the website, I have not mm -hmm. advertised at all. It's all word um, of mouth. And it sounds like Facebook was, you know, people recommending on Facebook too, right? Yeah, there's the, the part of the search process and, and maybe, you, I mean, it is a marketing process uh, mm -hmm. that we do, but I don't pay for advertising. But um, part of the search process was for me to work with influencers in yes. the e-commerce industry. And I really have a great influencer that I enjoy working with a lot. And she and I partner on a, a number of projects together. And so she sends a lot of work my way. But there are others out there, too, that are influencers in the industry that have heard of my work. And they send work my way as well. Um, I have a, a couple of web uh, software uh, systems that we use and they've asked me to blog for them mm. so I, <laughs> I you know it goes out one of them goes out to 23,000 people every month 
Mm -hmm. um, I've got an article in it every month. And so it, those kinds of things, just getting into the industry and being somebody that can learn and deliver value, those uh, other people in the industry were really looking for that. Yes. And so it, my business took off as soon as I started connecting with influencers. Yes. Now that's a key point. And I want everybody to get that, that you notice that she made strategic relationships and it was in a very specific area. As a generalist, it's real hard to do that. But when you specialize, then you find people who are influential in that field. And then again, because most bookkeepers or accountants never do that, you now stand out as someone who understands their business. And we can see with Cindy's example, how powerful that is. She writes an article, which by the way, that is marketing, that's content marketing, but it's to what's known as a targeted audience. It's to exactly the type of clients who she understands, but then they recognize that she understands what they need. She's giving them information that's valuable for their business that in their niche they don't normally find. So it's all that it's like a perfect storm. All those pieces together make Cindy has probably very little, if any, competition so that everybody comes to her. And it's more the the challenge of keeping up with it right and then getting to be picky about the clients did you find when all this business was coming your way that your rates were also going up mm -hmm. my rates have gone up um and i've gotten very picky about who we work with uh, we have a steady source of leads i get at least a lead a day typically wow. um and so we have i, I did a facebook live with a um with a vendor that uh, is a software vendor, mm -hmm. different from the others I mentioned, but they had me on as a one-time Facebook Live thing in January. And, um, and this story's in Clockwork, Mike tells it in Clockwork, because mm -hmm. I I was freaking out. I, mm -hmm. he, uh, I, um, I did the Facebook Live, and that day got 76 leads hit my website, 76. Wow. Wow. And so Bree was already in the mode of sending out the email, let's talk. And I'm like, whoa, 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 we can't talk to 76 people. We can't quote 76 people. And so um, I sent a note out to Mike and um, a couple of other people at Profit First because I, I figured he was traveling. But he called me immediately and said he was, I think he was in, going from Switzerland to Berlin or somewhere. <laughs> he said, as soon as I land, I will call you because he was getting on the plane. And right. he did. And 30 minutes and he crafted this email that really s said very truthfully that we're small and we can't right. take a lot of different folk you know a lot of people and serve them well and it's very important to us that we serve them well and so this is our typical spend a client's typical spend to us right and it's you we would love to talk if not um you know there's a lot of resources on our blog whatever and that immediately cut all of those 76 down to I think we ended up talking to 44 of them though that's still um, a lot of crazy amount yeah we landed 20 up some 21 or two out of that now the brilliance with that as well and I've used that tactic even before I knew marketing many years ago but it's when you have that abundance mindset now you had the manifestation of the abundance but when you say what your standards are, this is how we do it, which is what Mike was saying, and having, look at, this is typically what we charge. You set expectations. Now, obviously those 44 that ended up still hanging in there through your filtering process, they weren't gonna be haggling with you over price <laughs> because they knew that you were a high level, highly specialized, that immediately puts you as a premium. And my best guess is the clients that you get now are probably relatively easy to work with because they know that if it doesn't work out, you can replace them very quickly and easily. Yeah, I mean, for the most part, that's true. Um, yeah, yeah. Well, once in a while, you know, people are people. Yeah, every once in a while. In fact, we just had one of those. <laughs> I was just like, I, I wish that were totally true. but. Mm -hmm. um, we, got one where we, we have one of our values is respect and he's a he's walking that line awfully close I'm yeah like, yeah you put that butt over there buddy yeah you're out of here yeah um, well you can always invoke what i call the win-win or no deal rule 
uh, because yeah. Yeah, and you just let them know, look, at this isn't a win. So if it's not a win for both of us, there's no real good reason for us to keep working together. And I have used that when it's difficult with a client. And if they want to keep working with you, it makes them shift immediately because they know that you don't have a problem with letting them go. Uh, yeah, it's exactly. it's reverse psychology because most of us as bookkeepers, you know, the client often and we ourselves will put ourselves in this role of almost like employee and begging for the work and the client will take advantage of that. But I want everybody to notice, look at how the tables totally shifted with Cindy uh, with specializing and now she's the one in high demand and they are clamoring for her. So now she's the one in, in the position of power and she's not begging for work. She can get as much as she wants, really. So now it begs the question, because you referred to it, is clockwork. Now, Mike's newest book, which came out on August 21st, uh, which was just a few weeks ago at the time of this recording, um, that book is all about how to get your business to run without you so that you do not need to be doing the sales, doing the admin, doing the actual bookkeeping, any of that, that basically your business, because you said you read the e-myth, the same principles of getting it to run without you. Now, tell us about that. I really am interested in hearing, first of all, it sounds like you wanted to do that anyway. It's almost from the beginning of starting your business. That was kind of a vision for you. But what was that journey like? Because your business well, runs without you now. It can. It, uh, it can. And um, it, it all started to change for me when Mike started working with me on the Queen Bee role, mm -hmm. um, or where we identify. I, I, was, I was working like crazy. I mean, I was not a happy camper. Mm -hmm. I'm in a really happy place right now. <laughs> but I was not for two years. I was working like crazy. We had a ton of work coming um, we were growing. Um, it, it just was really very busy. And um, so what Mike helped me figure out was, is the Queen Bee role, which is the thing that, that our business does that makes it all hum. And it, it has to do with delivering peace and calm. Hmm. And it, that's our emotional brand. I, every time a client talks to us, they come away re feeling reassured. And that's we chose that because I kept hearing that from people after I would talk with them. They'd go, oh, I just feel so much better. Mm. You just calm down. And I would hear that over and over again. And I'm like, that's what we need to sell because that's what's hurting. These people need some calm. They're struggling, you know. And I can't solve all their cash problems, but I can help put them in a frame of mind that they're not panicking mm -hmm. and they can help see their way out of it. I mean, we've got some strategies to help them too, but a lot of it's just like, take some breaths. <laughs> you know, and I, I, I don't, I, I'm not a very um, good at delivering woo-woo stuff. I believe in it, but I'm not good at delivering it, but I can tell them, you know, I can hold their hand and say, yeah, we're going to get through this and mm -hmm. here's how we're going to and give them some confidence and reassurance and then start asking them some questions because they know the answers. They just haven't had a chance to breathe to get there. Right. So that, that, that became our QBR. And what we figured out was that my communicating with clients was critical. And the analogy that Mike used that I just got once he explained it to me, and he talks about, I think, in the book, is a doctor's office. Mm -hmm. And when you go into a doctor's office, the doctor doesn't run and greet you and say, oh, let me get your file right. and let me check you in and give me your insurance card. The doctor comes and after you've been processed, you know, by the front desk person, maybe the insurance person, maybe the, the nurse has been in and taken your vitals, then you see the doctor. Mm -hmm. And they come in, they, they examine your chart, they ask you a few questions and they make a diagnosis and write your script and you're, you're on your way. And the doctor is free to just move from one room to the next doing what the doctor does best, his QBR. Right. And so once I started thinking about my business from that perspective and that my job was just to get on the phone with clients and deliver calm, that everything else somebody else needed to do. And they mm -hmm. needed to do it consistent with what 
that, that calming. I, I never wanted anybody to feel frantic in the way we deal, deal with them. I want them to have that feeling of calm throughout. But other people c could do the pieces of it um, and support that. And once, once I shed enough of that, that um, that's really all I was doing, I realized I could get rid of that too, that all of that could be that role does not have to be me. Mm. That it's role. And so once once I got enough of it off my plate that I could think clearly again, then I could see, okay, somebody can do this part too. And wow. I handled it all off. Wow. So basically for those, you need to read the book Clockwork. But mm -hmm. Queen Bee role is kind of like the unique thing that you provide that is the highest value to the client. And that's what Cindy was explaining. But here's the cool part. She now got to the point where someone else could even do that. And now she's the business owner. She's the one who can strategize and design what happens with her business and does not need to even be involved with the clients at all, right? That's right. I don't even know most of them now. Wow. So I was going to say, did you get any pushback at all from either your employees or from the clients or excuse me or both for you basically stepping out of it and was there any fear involved too in stepping out meaning that maybe the employees could take off with your business you know like you're losing control of it I never felt that way. I, I the team is amazing. Um, we took a few trial one week vacations. And at one point, we were down to the last 90 days of before we were leaving. And mm -hmm. and my husband, who's in the business with me now and has been for a couple of years, he was like, I just don't think it's fair that we go off and, and do another trial because we're putting more work on the team. And the team was coming to me saying, we need you guys to get away from here so we can practice. And so I said, I know, but we got to talk to him because he doesn't see it that way. Well, we had a training, and at that training, they provided him with an award, and he, he at that time, was our only male, and so he got the Male Employee of the Year Award. <laughs> it, it entitled him, non-negotiably, he had to take a week's vacation, <laughs> and um, and he got the point, and he, he and my daughter took off on their motorcycles and went for a ride and had had a great time, <laughs> but, uh, you know, I, I, they're just, their head, it, we're building this together, and um, I, you know, I, I, I don't have that fear at all. I've, I've never had it. I've got great people. That's great. So how many people do you have now? Like, like what does your business look like now? There's 12 of us. Um, mm, my wow. husband and I are in the, in the firm, um, both of us really mostly in the designing role now. Um, he, he's much more on the operation side of things than I'm on the uh, marketing sales um, side of things. Um, we have a core team of four people and they run the business uh, when we're not here. They handle every function, um, mm. all the admin for the business, HR, um, onboarding, new clients, um, sales and marketing and then operations so they, they handle all those roles and um, and then under them we've got bookkeepers that um, work in uh, some of them work very part-time some of them work almost full-time it just depends on you know what their what their family needs are that mm -hmm. that was a really huge piece of the construction of the business it was why I got in business to begin with and this model was because I needed that flexibility to right. be with my daughter, to be able to drive her, et cetera. And so it, it's, it's a huge value for us that we maintain um, that flexibility for our employees. So, cause mm -hmm. they're all remote. They're all remote. You said, yeah. Right. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. That was my next question that if you have 12 employees and you're still working from home, that means you don't have a commercial office. Everybody, I assume, on your team is not local either. No, nope. they're all over. The so, wow. So basically, you've done all this in the span of about four years. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's amazing, amazing. 
Wow. Well, Cindy, so do you have any advice for those who either are just starting out or maybe have been working on their own but would like to grow and build a business similar to like yours where they can ultimately keep that lifestyle but also have the hands off? Any words of advice? Because you've been through a lot in four years. Um, the niche specialization is huge. Uh, it's, it's just I'm convinced there's no other way to grow um, to, without it. Uh, it. It just gives you that ability to become the expert. It gives you the ability to have processes that are repeatable. Um, you know, things change all the time. I mean, Amazon right. changes things. Right. I mean, it's, everything is changing, so it's not like our world is cookie cutter. But I can't imagine learning that for multiple industries because, you know, landscapers have an app and, and acupuncturists have an app, but everybody has their, excuse me, their software that they use to collect money and, and so I can't imagine learning it beyond an industry. So if that focus is, is just huge in my opinion. I, I think once you start down that path, it allows you to, to move the rest of the way. Otherwise, I think you, you get stuck in just paying people to help you, uh, and you, you can't ever achieve that industry um, expert status if you, if you ha are serving multiple industries. Yep, yep, I agree. I agree with you. So I guess it would be safe to say one of the best things that you could do right now, and Mike's not paying us to do this, but is to uh, read his books. Uh, I'd say Pumpkin Plan, because Pumpkin Plan talks about uh, the specialization. It's still, hmm, I think it's still my favorite book, um, but I love Profit First and Clockwork as well. Uh, excellent, excellent yeah. books to help. We pumpkin plan our business every three months. We mm. go and we look at who we're cutting loose. Um, mm. if, you know, it really does make a huge difference. You can't have capacity to grow if you're serving people that are a drain on your business. It, and so, um, we uh, tomorrow is my team retreat, and oh. we'll, every every bookkeeper will rate their clients, and we will determine which ones we're going to keep and which ones we're not. And by the way, if you're hearing background noise, it's the thunder here now. <laughs> got to Florida, hurry. <laughs> yeah, I got here fast. <laughs> so just, just the points, I guess the takeaways from this interview, I knew that there would be a lot here, but is to specialize your practice because that's going to make your marketing very easy. Build relationships as you're marketing with existing clients and then obviously influencers in whatever niche you end up choosing. And then from there, you need to grow if you're going to truly dominate that niche or not even dominate, but just have a, a real successful business. You cannot do it by yourself. You'll have to hire help. And when you do that, start moving towards getting that business to run so that you don't have to be working your brains out. Because like you said, you went through, once the niche part took off, that's when it got crazy busy and you had to get to that, that goal of saying, hey, we, this can't continue this way. And you started building the business so oh, that you yeah. could be a business owner and not be running it. So. It's like a garden. <laughs> That's what I really wanted to do. I just was missing being able to garden. You mm -hmm. know, I was working all the time. So yeah, you got to have your life back. Yeah. And it, how long did it take you to get to that point to being able to step away and take time off? 18 months. Hmm. Very good. Excellent. I, my, I set my, um, my trip 18 months before I took it. So we took we took off the month of July of 2018. Mm -hmm. And eight months before that is when I selected July. So that was, it took 18 months for it to happen. Fantastic. Did you have to hurry at the end? <laughs> I didn't, but my husband's side of the business did. He, mm -hmm. um, we had a, a hire that was not perfect mm -hmm. in the operations role. 
and we figured that out about January. Luckily, we found somebody that um, could come on right after tax season. She had to see her current business through tax season, mm -hmm. but she came on mid-April, and we had to get her totally up to speed to be in a leadership role before we left the 1st of July, so that was a lot of hurrying. Um, and then she got appendicitis, and she had to be in the hospital and have her appendix removed, and then she had to go to California for a death in the family. I was like, oh, oh. my God. <laughs> but she's been fabulous. She's just absolutely great. But, it, you know, it's like everything was conspiring right there at the end to make it a little bit of a challenge. But yeah. we did it. And I'll tell you the best part about it, Gabrielle. Mm -hmm. When I got back, I, I expected everything to work. I, mm -hmm. I did not expect problems. I, I really didn't. They're, they're a wonderful team. I knew they'd do well. What I didn't expect, because they came here the second day after we got off the plane back, uh -huh. and they, they were like, this went really good, and we are doing really great, and you guys better stay out of this and not mess it up. <laughs> you know, like, That's fantastic. They, yeah, they were just adamant you guys if you step back in too much you're going to screw this up and we'll have to do it again and you guys better <laughs> so you know my husband and I are like okay we're not going to the business Monday meetings anymore that's y'all's we're not um we're not going to do the huddles we 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 join occasionally but we're not there every week and they lead them and it, it has given us the opportunity to we work every day but it's mm -hmm. in my office um developing our plans for our next phase of growth mm -hmm. and uh, wow. totally different yes yeah, totally different way of working now than before we left because they they took ownership that part of it totally surprised me i i had no idea that was what was going to happen wow so what's okay. next for you i have a book that's coming out january 1st no, january 8th. releasing it january 8th and wow. uh and it's profit first for e-commerce sellers and um, I've been working with Mike, so it'll be, uh, I think it's the first derivative off of Profit First for a particular uh, vertical. Mm -hmm. And so, um, it went to the editor on Monday and for the, for the final edit, and uh, it'll be going to production the 1st of October. So I'm excited. That's fantastic. <laughs> Congratulations. Wow. Definitely let us know when that's out. It can help you okay. with uh, passing the word for others who who could pass it around and, uh, you know, get it rolling. Support those e-commerce businesses and then, of course, the bookkeepers that support them. <laughs> yeah, exactly, because there's a lot you can do to help them. So yes. thank you. Yes. Awesome. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Cindy. I appreciate it. As always, I love speaking with you, and I'll be seeing you uh, just in a few weeks at uh, – the Profit Con conference, and then also likely at QuickBooks Connect if you're going. Yeah, okay. plan So ex excellent. Plan All right. to see you. Yes, <laughs> good to see you. Take care. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm.